Hi, I'm Nico Stuermann. I'm a staff scientist at UCSF, and I prepared this uh, lecture together with Kurt Thorne, who's the director of the Nikon Im Imaging Center at UCSF. And I want to start out with presenting to you this nice, complicated new microscope system that we um, have in the lab. So here we have a microscope system that we use in the lab every day. Actually, people fight for time on this system. You recognize here probably the uh, microscope body itself, with the eyepieces, there's the objective lens uh, down there. There is a uh, motorized XY stage sitting here that I can control with the joystick or from the computer. Then here on the side, we have a spinning disc confocal unit. And elsewhere in the co course, it will be explained how that spinning disc uh, works. But then at this, here we have a um, very fundamental part of this microscope system and that is a digital camera. So this digital camera is the thing that actually registers the image, it collects the image and then sends that image through a cable to something else you will recognize that is a computer. That computer can then hold the digital image in its memory or can write it to disk or can display it on the computer screen. And here in the computer we can do all kinds of manipulations so we can um, uh, visualize the data which is something you always want to do. But we can also do analysis, digital image analysis uh, on these images and extract quantitative information about the things that we see in the microscope. And so in this lecture I'll first be explaining to you the principles of how a digital camera works and then also give you a very basic introduction to digital images and digital images analysis. So we're going to talk about cameras and um, to just give you another idea, this is an other camera. Um, it's a box, it has a bunch of electronics in it. Often it has something like cooling, but the part that is really important is shown here and blown up here in this figure. It's the chip, the chip with um, photosensitive elements. So it contains rows and columns, rows and columns of photosensitive elements that we often call pixels, pixel elements. And so each of these pixel elements is able to detect a flow of uh, photons. Now, to give you a bit of a schematic overview, one blown up here, um, photons are coming in and by this semiconductor material through the photoelectric effect are converted into electrons. Those electrons are stored for the duration of the exposure in a uh, potential well. And then at a certain point in time, the uh, number of electrons is being read out and transferred as a digital number to the computer. Bunch of parameters with these pixels that are of interest to us. So for instance, the most basic one is like how large is a pixel, its width and height. And we have an example here of the uh, Sony ICX285 chip, which is a uh, CCD chip that has been used now for years in microscopy, a very popular uh, chip design, and that has pixels of about six and a half microns square. The other number that's important is how many we have. So how many rows, how many columns. If you actually multiply that by this number, you get the physical size of the chip. And so for the ICX285 chip that has uh, about 1400 uh, columns and about a thousand or so uh, rows for a total of 1.4 megapixels. And you see this is much less than most of our uh, cell phone or digit cameras or digital SLRs have. So how many pixels do we actually need in a microscope? And um, we know that if you have fewer and fewer pixels, you get um, a blockier and blockier, a more 
pixelated image. And so you know that that is not good. So too few of them is clearly not right. But if we have more pixels, um, is there a point that it doesn't make any sense anymore? And clearly there is such a point. And um, when you now think about that is what you try to do is to match the pixel size that you have to the resolution of your microscope system. And so how do you match the two? Well, people in the signal processing world have thought about this problem for many, many years. And so a long time ago, they've come up with the so-called Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. And that states that for the smallest um, uh, uh, limit, the smallest distance that you can resolve, you will need two, at least two digital uh, samples. And so in practice, in a microscope system, that means that we need two to three pixels to cover the resolution limit of the microscope. And so what is the resolution limit of the microscope? And so you have seen in other lectures that there are various criteria for determining that. And as an example here, I'm using the uh, Rayleigh criteria. If we now have a 100x lens, that magnifies a hundredfold with a numerical aperture of 1.4 NA. And we assume uh, green light, wavelength of 500 nanometers. Then the Rayleigh criterion states that uh, the resolution limit, the shortest distance within which we can still discriminate two point objects, is given by uh, 0.61 times the wavelength of the light divided by the numerical aperture. And that, in this case, leads to a number of about 220 nanometers. Now, since we have a 100x lens, that means, so we need to uh, multiply that 220 nanometers by 100. In the camera plane, that then corresponds to 22 microns. Now, according to the Nyquist theorem, we need at least two pixels for every 22 microns. And that means that uh, the pixels need to be 11 microns or smaller. And so, for instance, our ICX285 um, camera, based camera, has six and a half micron uh, pixels, so they clearly would fulfill here the Nyquist uh, sampling rate. But it, when you, whenever you buy a camera uh, and want to match that to your existing microscope, these are the kind of calculations you would want to make. Now in um, microscopy, especially in fluorescence microscopy, we barely ever use color cameras. And why is that? Well, that follows from the design of color cameras. So color cameras actually are, uh, have the same kind of chip, uh, a monochrome chip. However, in front of each pixel element, a small colored mask has been uh, put. So, for instance, in this Bayer uh, mask, and that is what most RGB cameras use, every four pixels we'll have two that are, uh, have a green filter, one blue one and one red one. And that now means that when you have a green photon hitting this Bayer mask, that only the ones um, uh, hitting half of these pixels will actually make it and be detected. And the ones that hit the other half will not be detected and you lose them. So a lot of light is being lost. And in fluorescence microscopy, we really like to put our filters inside the microscope and we can design much better filters than the ones over here. Um, of course, in things like uh, observation of histology sections, where you care much less about light loss, color cameras are totally fine, but for fluorescence microscopy, you want to use a, a monochrome camera. Another parameter in cameras that is very important is their sensitivity. And the most important parameter there is the quantum efficiency, and that means uh, of the photons that actually hit the cameras, what fraction is converted into an electron that I can then later read out and actually see in my computer. Um, the quantum efficiency depends on the chip design. So for instance, these back-thinned CCDs, 
uh, have a very high, can have a very high quantum efficiency, up to 95%. Quantum efficiency is also wavelength dependent, so you want to make sure that uh, it matches the, the dyes or the things that you're looking at. Nevertheless, you know, many cameras nowadays will have between 70 uh, and 90, 95% quantum efficiency. So there are other uh, sources of noise in cameras. However, when we start talking about noise, the very first thing to realize is that there is noise present in any um, uh, light signal. And that is due to the fact that your camera measures photons. The photons are particles. So particles will, even though the average of a stream is constant, they will not uh, arrive the pixel element in a very regular way. There will be uh, uh, statistical um, um, uh, noise there. And that statistical noise is what we call shot noise. Shot noise has a Poisson distribution, and that then uh, dictates that the amount of noise scales with the square root of the number of photons. And that means that if we have a very bright signal square root is relatively small with respect to the signal, whereas when we have a very dim signal, the square root is pretty high with respect to the signal, i.e. low amount of light. Just the shot noise will already have an, a large effect, whereas when we have a bright signal, the shot noise is pretty low. But you have to remember, we can never do better. Your camera can never improve on the shot noise. The shot noise is what comes with your actual signal. And so on top of that, your camera will add noise. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, uh, the faster a camera runs, the more noise it will add. If you run a camera very slowly, give it a lot of time to read out its image, it can have a very low, uh, low noise. So luckily, Camera manufacturers keep on working on these kind of technical aspects. There are various schemes to, to deal with these um, uh, camera-induced noise factors. So for instance, there are cameras that use a uh, so-called electron multiplication gain. There are uh, scientific CMOS cameras that have very low readout noise. Um, uh, so that means that there's a bright future and good decent cameras will, with low noise will become more and more affordable and, and easier to integrate into your microscope system. So enough about cameras and how they work. Cameras generate an image, a digital image in the computer. So what is a digital image? And I'm now giving you here an example of an image of diffraction limited spots. So these could be um, single molecules. It could actually as well be an image of stars in the sky, but in this case they are single molecules. I take this little area here and we now zoom this up in the computer and what you see is this little pixelated uh, area. So we see these uh, pixel elements that actually correspond to the pixels that we had in the camera originally. Now so this is a representation of the image, but what does the computer now have in its memory? And so when we look at that, we will see that in its memory, the computer has rows and columns of numbers. And these numbers are then being uh, uh, matched to grayscale values on the display. The actual image though is rows and columns of numbers. These numbers um, were measured by the pixels in the camera and in the end these numbers correlate, correlate with the number of photons that hit that photosensitive element and were caught and converted in el electrons, in photoelectrons. So actually a, um, uh, these numbers do not map one to one to the number of photons. However, a uh, decent scientific grade camera will have a data sheet that gives you the so-called photon conversion factor. And with that photon conversion factor, you can map uh, this digital number in the actual number of photons that were detected by that pixel, which in the end is really what you 
uh, would like to know and how you can make a fair comparison between uh, different images. Now the important point again is that your image is a matrix, rows and columns of numbers that tell you how at each of these pixel elements how much light was detected there during your exposure. And what you want to be absolutely sure of is that your software is not changing those numbers because that would be changing your actual measurements. And at every point in time, you want to be sure what is going on with these numbers. And remember that the image is just a way of displaying the uh, numbers, your measurements. Now, images can, uh, so we now know they consist of numbers they can have different ranges of numbers. So the images uh, we've been looking at so far are so-called 8-bit images. Um, they're contained in one byte. And uh, an 8-bit image, uh, 8 bits, 8 zeros, have, can have 256 grayscale values. That means we have 256 numbers, and those we map then to intensities on the screen. However, you can also have an image that has only one bit dynamic range. And that means then that we have two grayscale values, and that is zero and black. And this is what we call a binary image. You can have an image that has two bits, four grayscale, uh, four grayscale values, four bits, 16 grayscale values. And with 16 grayscale values, you can see that that already starts to look a lot like these 256 here. But there's no reason to stop at one byte and just 256 grayscale values. Many of the modern cameras have a very large dynamic range, much larger than 256. So we need to encode that in more uh, bits. And so we need then at least two bytes. And for instance, many cameras have uh, a dynamic range of 12 bits, 4096 grayscale values or 16 bits where you have almost um, something on the order of 65,000 different grayscale values. Now, um, that dynamic range also in the end determines the image quality and determines the information content of the image. And just to give you an idea of that, I encoded uh, an image here in two bits, four bits, six bits, and eight bits. And you see that the eight bits image looks like a real image. We see all kinds of different things here. We um, see detail in, in uh, we see some uh, detail here in all those areas. And that detail completely disappears in this image that consists of only four grayscale values. So the number of grayscale values also determines the information content of the image. On the other hand, it's kind of interesting that this 4-bit image already looks a lot like the, the real image. Remember, we have only four grayscale values here. It works already pretty well. Uh, and when you look here, 4 bits starts to look better, but this looks still quite pixelated. But here with the uh, 6 bits, so that's just 64 grayscale values, uh, looks here on my screen almost the same as the 8-bit uh, image. So the human eye and displays like this actually cannot discriminate more than uh, roughly 100 different grayscale values. And that's why these 8-bit images uh, are often good enough to, uh, um, to present themselves uh, very well. So as I already said, an, a monitor, uh, the displays you use on your phone and your computer, uh, in general, has only, um, can only display 256 different grayscale values. And that is fine because your eyes, your accommodated eye, can actually not even uh, discriminate each of those from each other. But that also implies something funny because if we now have a one-bit image, uh, it has a value 0 and a value of 1. If we just put that directly on that 8-bit display, you will see that both values are black. So the value 0 is black and the value 1 is black because the 8-bit display, and we see that shown here, 
is that all these low values will have a very dark uh, uh, way of displaying. And so conversely, if we have uh, these images that have like many, many grayscale values, so the 12-bit uh, image, for instance, with 4096 grayscale values, everything higher than 256, if you display that on your monitor, will be white. You can't see it. And so that means that we need a way of mapping these pixel values that we have in our image onto the monitor that can uh, display it. So we don't want to change the underlying values. We just want to change the mapping from those values onto the monitor. Now, so in practice, the way you do that is often by manipulating a function that looks something like this. So we have a function that maps the uh, original intensity. So here, this is a 12-bit display uh, image going from 0 to 4095. And we map that to the display on the monitor. Now, the simplest way of doing that is uh, to use a linear mapping. So we set 0 in the original image to 0 on the display. And we set the highest value, 4095 in the image, to uh, 255, the highest value on the display. So if you do that, you have to be aware that you're not seeing all the detail that you have in the image. For instance, all the values between 4080 and 4095 will all be shown on the monitor as pure white, as 255. So often you want to manipulate this function so that it brings out all the detail that you have in the image. And so, uh, manipulating this function you often do by moving uh, the maximum or by moving the minimum. And when you move each of these uh, by themselves, what you change is the, the slope of this line. And when you change the slope of the line, that will change the contrast that you see in the image. For instance, if you now start to make lower pixel values white, then the brighter areas of your image will get wider and wider, whereas the dimmer images of the, area, uh, of the image will stay the same, so that will increase the contrast. So when you move the minimum and maximum simultaneously, what you will be doing is changing the brightness of the image. So another tool that is very useful when you uh, are manipulating image display is the histogram. So a histogram will display for every grayscale image, for every grayscale value in your image, how many pixels there are that have that specific grayscale, that, that have that specific number. So we have here on the y-axis the number of pixels, on the x-axis is the uh, pixel value, and you see here that at this specific uh, grayscale value we have a lot of them, so that's probably the background here in our image. And so often you use this histogram to match the uh, maximum and minimum. Uh, you set the maximum to the maximum pixel value in your image, the minimum to the minimum pixel value in your image. You already have a very good starting point to look at the, uh, the, what is going on in your image. Um, just to give a few examples, we have here another uh, Drosophila spindle image. When we now scale this to the minimum and maximum, as I described, you see the um, uh, kinetic or fibers and you see some detail here elsewhere in the cell. You can now make that uh, come out a bit more by moving that maximum, so that makes the, uh, the image brighter. It increases the contrast. Um, if we now move also the minimum here, then you see that the darker areas of this image are totally being clipped off and uh, it disappears. So we have here an even higher contrast and we start to lose some of the information here, but we possibly can make out a bit more of what's going on with these brighter uh, kinetic or fibers. So each of these ways of displaying the data is in a way equally valid. Uh, when you compare images with each other, it's very important that you use the same brightness contrast settings, otherwise you don't know what you're comparing with each other. Uh, 
Um, and in general, you really should be sure that if you want to use your images to make a point to others, that you describe how you are displaying the data. Quick word about color images. So color images in the computer are basically treated as individual uh, grayscale images where we now have for an RGB uh, data set, we have a red image, a green image, and a blue image. Each of the, in the computer memory, sees it as rows and columns of numbers that then, uh, where we just arbitrarily say, okay, this one is gonna be displayed red, this one green, and this one blue. And when we combine that all together, we get back our RGB image. And just like monochrome images, RGB images can be stored with, uh, in one or two bytes per channel. Most consumer grade channels will be one byte per channel. Uh, but when you go to SLRs with raw images or professional grade RGB cameras, they can have a, a, a much larger dynamic range and use two bytes uh, per channel. File formats. So once you have your data in the computer, you want to store them one way or another on disk, such that you can also exchange them with other people. What is important to remember here is that many of the file formats will try to compress the data for you. Compression is nice because it reduces the amount uh, of data um, uh, that will be taken up on the hard drive. However, some forms of compression will uh, no longer allow you to restore the original data. And that is bad because you won't later be able to know exactly what the camera has measured. And so therefore we, um, uh, we call, have terms for this. One is lossy compression. So lossy compression, we lose data, we cannot get it back again. Lossless compression is a compression where you do not lose data, so you have an, a way of restoring the exact original image content. So lossless compression is okay. Lossy compression is not good if you want to continue your analysis. File format that is widely used is the so-called uh, TIFF format. Uh, TIFF is a container format. There are many different ways of storing your data within a TIFF. You can have 8 or 16-bit uh, data. You can have, uh, it can incorporate lossless uh, compression. It supports grayscale as well as RGB images. And in general, TIFFs are really a nice way uh, uh, to store your data and you can exchange it easily with others. There are a bunch of, uh, there's a whole lot more actually than these more proprietary uh, data formats some of them more open than others. Ones that you will also know are things like JPEGs, GIFs, BMPs. And in general, this class of file format is not great to store your scientific uh, grade da data. Uh, for instance, JPEGs use a lossy compression scheme, bad because you cannot restore your original data uh, and others uh, like GIFs and BMPs can only store 8-bit data, so that's already out when you have um, uh, 12 or 16-bit images. Now, one uh, project that needs, that deserves mention here is the Bioformats um, project. And so the people behind this have decided to make a tool that is able to read all these different file formats, but also the hundreds more that are out there and that the different microscope comp and camera companies have come up with. And so with this bioformats that's used in many different software packages, including ImageJ, you can read more or less anything uh, uh, that you encounter. So super useful software. Now, when you have your digital image, you will want to measure something. And often uh, the following way is taken to do so, it's done by segmentation. And in segmentation, what you do is to create a mask of things that are in and conversely things that are out. So um, that mask is a binary image. So uh, it just contains one bit per pixel. And when it's uh, one, that means it's in. And when it's zero, that means it's out. So it's background. Uh, 
And the easiest way of segmenting is to look at your uh, grayscale values and move a slider and say everything below this specific grayscale value is out and everything higher than this grayscale value is in. And that's how you can do a segmentation like this where you see that these spots correspond pretty nicely to what you see in your dot plot. There's also uh, some uh, junk here, little things, and there's some uh, binary uh, manipulation techniques, uh, erosion, dilation, where you erode your pixels in and then dilate them back out again so that they restore the original. But then things that are too small simply erode out and disappear. You can see that you can then nicely clean it up and now the spots correspond very well to the spot in the dot blot. Um, so measuring objects then often consists of starting out with the image, do a segmentation so that you get masks that correspond to the original objects. You now, each of these masks you put over the original image and you ask what were the grayscale uh, pixel values there. And you can get out the total number of pixels, the mean, the integrated density, and you get then a list uh, with uh, the intensity under each of these objects. And that already can give you a very clear idea of what is going on in this image. Now this is a very simplified way uh, to show you how measurements work. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, there's more and more image analysis being used in biology. For instance, this is here a, a very recent uh, publication uh, in Nature Methods, where the authors developed a method to automatically uh, determine sites of uh, mRNA, uh, as mature mRNA as well as nascent RNA in uh, images uh, obtained by fluorescence in situ hybridization. So it goes to show how an automated image analysis procedure can give you very quickly and easily biological insights extracted out of the image. And another example I want to show you uh, comes from this RNAi uh, screen that we did, that our group did a few years ago in uh, Drosophila S2 uh, cells where we were looking for genes affecting mitotic spindles and where we used these kind of image analysis techniques to automatically detect mitotic spindles in the images that we acquired and to measure various aspects like for instance the distance between these poles to get an idea of the uh, spindle length. Now I hope you got a uh, basic understanding of how digital imaging in uh, microscopy works and uh, um, you know go ahead and play with these techniques yourself and have a lot of fun with it. Thank you.